Hi, welcome to the another episode of uh, Academy of Bronchoscopy monthly webinar series. And we have a very special guest from US this month. And the topic is um, mediastinal cryobiopsy, uh, the hot topic currently in discussion, especially in this part of the world. And we will, uh, I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Arthur Oliver Romero, he's a director of intervention pulmonology and associate professor of medicine at the uh, um, Korean School of Medicine and uh, he received his medical degree from uh, University of Philippines and his MSc in Medical Informatics from the Netherlands Institute for Health and Sciences at Rotterdam. So he continued his postgraduate training in internal medicine and pulmonary critical care with, at um, UCSF and in Las Vegas he joined Academy and helped establish the Pulmonary and Critical Care Fellowship at UNLV. Um, so his area of interest includes uh, more of a robotic navigation bronchoscopy, uh, thoracic oncology, plural disease, and bronchoscopy education. Uh, we are very glad and we thank Arthur uh, for coming here and accepting this invitation on a Sunday, especially. And um, coming to mediastinal lymph node cryobiopsis, we uh, do a lot of mediastinal cryobiopsis in this part of the world, uh, especially. And um, I, I, whenever we talk on mediastinal cryobiopsy, a lot of discussion is there saying we are very happy with the needles. Why do you need this procedure? But uh, but there are a lot of changes that happened in mediastinal lymph node sampling. But uh, you, you see one comparison like the forceps biopsies. Though the data shows that the forceps diagnostic yield is very high, but uh, the, the transition into clinical practice didn't happen in many centers. Like many people don't do it um, but if you the same, if you look at cryobiopsies, um, the clinical application has become very rapid. Many centers started doing um, uh, cryobiopsies more than forceps biopsies because of the ease of procedure. And uh, we are one of the centers who started doing this with the needle technique. And uh, uh, we have uh, published initial data on this. And we are uh, we think this will be an add-on tool uh, for the mediastinal lymph node sampling. So, Dr. Arthur will um, review the current available literature on mediastinal lymph node cryobiopsies, and then we can have, uh, we'll shortly be joined by one of um, the panelists, Dr. Deepak, he'll be coming soon and joining us. So, Dr. Arthur, um, you, you can start your presentation, and th well, thanks once again for accepting this invitation from the Academy of Bronchoscopy. Okay. So, first of all, I want to say thank you to your team, Dr. Gunagundla, for allowing me to participate, and I am uh, honored to be with you this morning. So um, I think it's just good evening to the guys there in India. It's it's uh, seven thirty a.m. here where I am in the United States. So as uh, Dr. Harry mentioned, I'm going to talk about EBUS guided mediastinal cryobiopsy. So just a disclosure, I do get consulting fees from Intuitive Surgical and has no uh, bearing on this topic. So this evening, we're going to talk about uh, our objectives. Let's enumerate the approaches to mediastinal and hyalur biopsy, describe the evolution of EBUS-guided transbronchial mediastinal cryobiopsy, review the diagnostic yield and safety of EBUS cryo, and discuss technical and procedural aspects of EBUS cryobiopsy. So when we're talking about the mediastinum, we need to at least be familiar with our anatomy. So and this is just a, I'm not gonna go through this in any extensive level, but we used to classify the mediastinum into anterior, middle, and posterior compartments, and that was based on the lateral X-ray. So there's new guidelines now based on CT-guided anatomic divisions and you can see that the anterior is now called prevascular, the middle compartment is now called visceral, and the posterior compartment is called paravertebral. And for those of us in thoracic oncology working with you know, EBUS and EBUS cryo, uh, at a very minimum, we should be familiar with anatomy. And those of us who do EBUS, we should know this by, uh, you know, by heart. Our lymph node stations, how to get to these targets. And I mentioned this because EBUS cryobiopsy, at the very least, should require a very competent EBUS proceduralist. Uh, I would hope that everyone, anyone who would try this procedure is very comfortable with EBUS, can find all the lymph node stations, has good technique, very safe, and also with a good rhythm with the procedure that they're able to 
do stations very quickly because you don't want someone who's pretty novice learning the procedure to expand to prior probes because as is, as we will discuss, it's pretty safe, but you want someone who has enough experience. So shifting to medicinal sampling, why do we even do EBUS cryobiopsy? So back in the day, I guess even when I started my own training, most of the medicinal sampling was done by mediastinoscopy. Then there's this Chamberlain procedure or anterior mediastinoscopy where you can access, you know, uh, pyrosternal located access uh, lymph nodes. Then there's always thoracotomy, there's always bats, there's always robotic surgery. Uh, come interventional radiology. So you can also access medicinal structures depending on where they are through needle aspiration, whether ultrasound guided or CT guided. And the least invasive, and that's where we come in as bronchoscopists, is EBUS TBNA. And some of us also are familiar with EUSB, right? Endoscopic ultrasound bronchoscopy, which will allow us to expand our access to the mediastinum. And the other thing, the other modification that needs to be mentioned, as uh, Harry mentioned earlier, is uh, internodal forceps. So this had some potential of improving our yields, but as mentioned, it did not translate to clinical application as much. So going back to the mediastinum, we're familiar with the lymph nodes. And what the beauty of EBUS is real-time imaging. And you know where you are. So if you're good with control, you should be able to guide your needle or whatever tool within a millimeter distance from structures, whether it's bronchial blood vessels in the lymph node or to your major vessels in the, such as the aorta or the SVC. And again, this is important because you potentially will be accessing, if not potentially damaging, central veins and arteries in the chest that could be life-threatening. So let's talk about cryoprobes. So um, cryoprobes are, again, these are uh, rods or wires that come in different sizes. The initial models were very uh, were reusable. I'm not sure if you ha had that uh, over there in Yoshoda, but when I started training, the, we started using with the reusable probes, the 1.9 and the 2.4, and we used them for transbronchial cryobiopsy and debulking airway tumors. Only when the 1.1 reusable probe came to market were we able to use it for uh, EBUS applications. So here are the three probes that we have right now. The sizes are 1.1, 1.7, and 2.4. So our EBUS working channel is 2.2 millimeters. So the 1.1 certainly fits, and so will the 1.7, but uh, we will show that the 1.1 is the favored size for our application today. So what's the current practice? So EBUS has replaced mediastinoscopy as the procedure of choice for sampling medicinal lesions. The diagnostic yield is high, 93%, and even higher for malignancy. And what is frequently mentioned as the shortfall is it's uh, yield for lymphoma, which is 67 to 81% based on studies, and sarcoidosis around 80%. And the other part of this discussion is cryobiopsy. So where is it used right now? So it's used for transbronchial cryobiopsy of diffuse parenchymal lung disease. We even use it uh, in conjunction with our robotic bronchoscopy to sample lung nodules. And in certain applications, we use it for pleural biopsies. So the development of medicinal cryobiopsy uh, has been uh, going on for the past uh, well, three decades or so. So the first report of the flexible cryoprobe was in 1996 by Dr. Mather. So initially it was a rigid probe and they were able to develop a flexible probe mainly for debulking airway tumors. In 2009, in Germany, uh, Babiakin and his team started using this application for parenchymal lung lesions and it didn't really take off as much there but the first mention of using a cryoprobe for a lymph node was in 2013, also in Germany. And in this case, Frankie et al. used a device, it's a needle, a cryo needle, 
that was delivered through a sheath that uh, went into the lymph node using a pig model. Um, for some reason, which I could not determine, this didn't really take off. It seemed like uh, a good piece of technology, but it didn't go to market the way they trialed it. And uh, it was really, the technology was dormant for a long time. So the first reported human use uh, was seven years later in 2020 by Zhang et al. And this is uh, the, the group that's very prolific with uh, doing all these studies, as we will discuss. They are the ones who have done the two randomized trials published in 2021 and 2023, as we will discuss in a bit. Okay, so just some uh, pictures to start with. Um, Imagine you're doing EBUS, you've uh, done your needle biopsies, and now you're planning to put your cryoprobe through the defect in the airway wall. Now, there are different ways of track creation, but in terms of inserting your cryoprobe through the wall, I see it's basically two ways. Either you do it via ultrasound or you do it via direct visualization. And I've done both depending on the situation. So via ultrasound, you pass your needle and you keep your ultrasound in place. As you pull the needle out, you advance your prior probe and following the track and keeping the ultrasound angle uh, very steady, you pass the prior probe to the hole that you created. What I find more uh, convenient in my own experience is to create the hole on the airway wall after you do your needle biopsies. And I actually like to lift the scope off the wall so I can see the hole. Then I extend the cryo probe into the hole directly. And once the probe is in the hole, then I advance the scope, then I get the ultrasound view. So this is another view of the, the technique, but this one was done with the scope attached to the wall following the track of the needle. Okay, so during my study of this topic, I reviewed uh, all the published literature I can find on EBUS cryobiopsy. And I came up with about 30 articles. Uh, most of them are case reports. There are two randomized trials, uh, both done by the same group. And then there are some case series uh, anywhere from you know 40 or so 20 to 60 patients that also adds to some considerable data and the rest are smaller number cases uh, as you can see in this table the technique uh, varies uh, across the board so in terms of sampling design anesthesia so conscious sedation is used very frequently some use general anesthesia some use only total IV. In terms of the airway, a lot do transoral with conscious sedation, but some centers use LMA. And there are even some that use rigid bronchoscopes, um, mo mostly case reports. And then the targeted lymph nodes, the most common ones are 7, 4R, 4L, and then the higher ones. But the larger studies, you will see that they've sampled anywhere from level two to level 13 lymph nodes. Number of needle passes, again, it really depends on the preference of the operator. In terms of the size of the needle, it's also across the board. 19, 21, 22, and there are also different types of needles that I'm not gonna go into here now, but there's you know regular needles, Francine tip, core needles. Rows, for the most part, was not used in the larger studies. But I think this has bearing uh, in this technique, uh, and we will discuss later. Most of the studies used a 1.1 cryoprobe, and all of them created the track um, mostly with needle, although some of the studies, they preferred to use electrocautery knife, and we will talk about that too. Other controversial issues, how many passes, and the freeze time. So, the next table here compares the studies in terms of their results. So just looking at it from a general view, TBNA, TBNA yield and cryo yield. 
So across the board, the cryo yield is higher. And the 100 and zero, are, these, are, these are the case reports. So that's just like one and zero. But as you can see, um, overall yield for cryo is higher. And this varies in diagnoses, uh, cancer, lymphoma, sarcoidosis, and tuberculosis, and all that. What we need to highlight, though, is that the added yield benefit is more specific to non-malignant, as we will see in the studies later. Now, it's clearly a safe procedure because in the, all of the studies, the complication rate is pretty low. You're mostly encountering pneumothoraces and pneumomedistinum, but none of it are clinically relevant or uh, to the point that uh, it would give you some pause. But there's a cautionary tale that I will share with you uh, in a little bit. Okay, so let's go to the studies. So this is the first large trial that was uh, conducted by the joint group between the University of Heidelberg and Chongqing in China uh, with Dr. Felix Hirth, as a lot of you may know, is a very prominent person uh, in the field. So it's a two-center trial, Germany and China, and they enrolled patients aged 15 and above found to have a mediastinal lesion greater than one centimeter. So they were able to find 197 patients in both their centers, and their study design is a crossover method. So they wanted to do both needle and cryo for all their patients. What they decided to do was just randomize which one will go first. So they randomized to either needle first, then cryo, or randomized to cryo first, then needle. And in this study, they wanted mainly to look at diagnostic yield and safety of the procedure. So they used contrasedation on all their patients, and notably, they used an electrocautery needle knife for all their cases. They did not use rows as a standard step in their procedure. And I will include here now the very low complication rate, just two cases of pneumothoraces, one pneumomedistinum, and they do report some uh, mild, mild to moderate bleeding, but nothing that is critical. So looking at the results, so first thing I want to highlight is the comparison of the TBNA versus cryobiopsy alone. So they showed that the TBNA was able to make the diagnosis 80% of the time, whereas the cryobiopsy, the diagnostic yield is 91, 92%. And this is statistically significant. If you look at the types of diagnoses, for common tumors, your non-small cell and small cell lung cancer, the either technology is ranging around 65, 66%. So the, it's highlighting that there's not much difference between the yield comparing TBNA to cryobiopsy for your run-of-the-mill lung cancer. When you look at other less common diagnoses, such as uncommon tumors, lymphoma, and even inflammatory conditions such as sarcoidosis and tuberculosis, your yield, even though the numbers are lower, are more significant in terms of their difference. So the diagnostic yield, well, actually this is, this is comparing to relatively totals, but the yield from cryobiopsy is significantly higher uh, for these less common pathologies. Now, after they did that trial, they wanted to see, well, they found that the cryobiopsy is adequate in terms of making a diagnosis. And again, the safety profile was very reassuring. So they conducted their follow-up trial. Their follow-up trial, uh, again, done within the same group, Germany and two hospitals in China, still looking at 15 years old or older patients, lesions greater than one centimeter. And they were able to enroll 271 patients randomized to two groups. So in this case, the strategy is they're gonna compare a combined strategy, EBUS, TBNA and cryo versus EBUS alone. 
So this is now a comparison of standard of care, which is EBUS alone. And then what happens if they add cryo to the, in the mix? Still, they did their cases under conjure sedation and endpoints. So they still looked at diagnostic yield and safety, but now they're also collecting more data to help with determining specimen adequacy, size, and suitability for molecular genetic assay. This is for your targeted therapy and immunotherapy and procedure duration. So just table of the results. So as before, the overall diagnostic yield is higher in the combined procedure compared to uh, TBNA alone. So 94% for combined and 82%, at least from their trial. And there's, again, highlighting the more significant benefit of doing EBUS with cryo for non-malignant benign conditions. In this case, sarcoidosis, pneumoconiosis, and even the tuberculosis. The lymphoma aspect did not clearly pan out in the data from this trial compared to the previous one. But the same theme holds that if you're looking at your regular lung cancer, uh, not small cell and small cell, the yield between TBNA and cryo is pretty similar to the point that you can clearly argue now that if you have a patient who you think is high risk for lung cancer, um, chances are you're going to get the diagnosis with TBNA and that patient probably wouldn't benefit from you having to do cryo on top of that. So other results, they measured that the mean diameter of their specimen is 3.8 millimeters, mean area of 11.8 millimeters. It's not mentioned anywhere here, but this size is three times or more larger than samples that are collected from intranodal forceps biopsy specimens. And then the overall procedure time for the combined procedure is 22.3 minutes versus 17 minutes. Now, they're only doing one station for this trial, I need to mention. So they do uh, four passes with the needle and then one pass only with the cryo, which allows them to do uh, procedures relatively in a short period of time. Now, if you're doing a complete medicinal staging with EBUS, looking at other, other structures, um, you certainly will take more time doing your procedure. And they actually excluded those patients that they feel will need sampling of multiple targets. Now, that also showed that the sample that they collected yielded uh, good specimen for genomic testing and PDL1. So that that uh, and then the pneumothorax and pneumomedicinum rate is less than two percent of the patients. Again, consistent safety profile in uh, the second uh, randomized trial. So. So this is the first uh, large trial designed to assess the safety and efficacy of adding cryo to EBUS TBNA. And then again, acceptable safety profile and really good additional diagnostic yield for benign lesions and good sample yield for molecular and immunological assessments. Now the authors in their discussion are making an argument that this should be the first-line procedure for all medicinal lesions. That if you're working up a medicinal lesion from you know, all possible etiologies, all comers, that you do needle and cryo. Now, the issue with that is, number one, cryo is not available everywhere. Number two, I'm sure there's a large cost uh, issue that will come into play in a lot of the centers uh, here in North America, in Europe and even in other parts of the world where resources are more limited. So I'm not subscribing to that idea that it should be applied to every case. 
So another study that I found interesting is actually from your team there in Yoshoda. So I just wanted to bring this up because it proposes a more practical approach to doing biopsies uh, and considering when to use cryobiopsy. The uh, authors um, of the study were able to identify 196 patients who underwent EBUS tBNA. And what they wanted to do was have a criteria to identify which patients will move on to get a cryobiopsy. So they did rows on all their patients and they divided into the three categories. Diagnostic rows, non-diagnostic rows, and inadequate rows. So what happened? If you have a diagnostic rose, then you're done. You don't do mediastinal cryobiopsy. If you have the other two, non-diagnostic or inadequate, then you sort of doubt that you might be getting a good sample just with a needle. So then you move on to cryo to get more tissue. So the yield of EBUS cryo after DNA and inclusive growth was what they were looking for. And EBUS cryo was done in 46 patients and the additive yield is 43.7%. So my I like the concept of the study, but what I couldn't really understand is why the numbers were low in terms of the added diagnostic yield. And perhaps it's just the number of patients that ended up getting cryo. But here's the general schema. So they had 196 patients, 150 had diagnostic rows and adequates. So those were taken away from the pool. And from the those left behind, there were 46. 14 of them had inadequate rows, meaning they were atypical cells, but not diagnostic. And in the 32, it was non-diagnostic, meaning there was nothing, uh, perhaps more just bronchial cells or blood. So they mentioned that of the overall patients who went down the medicinal cryobiopsy route, um, the EBUS cryo achieved diagnosis in 71%. And for further down, the patients who were actually non-diagnostic on ROS, EBUS cryo diagnosed about 60% of these patients. They were able to follow all the patients down so even the ones that did not get diagnosed by EBUS cryo were accounted for. So there weren't any drop-offs. There were other cancers that were diagnosed. Uh, there was vasculitis, and some of them were reactive nodes. So as part of this uh, series, they were able to ascertain that the additive diagnostic yield of EBUS cryo over EBUS tBNA is 43% for patients who are uh, less than diagnostic rows during the biopsy. So they propose a uh, schema or an algorithm. So first you select patients who have undiagnosed adenopathy. You do rows when you do your EBUS. If your rows is adequate and diagnostic, then you do three more DBNA passes for cell block, which is actually what I do. I do three and even more depending on the size of the the specimen collected. If your ROS is non-diagnostic or inadequate, then you consider doing medicinal cryo. If the medicinal cryo biopsy is diagnostic, then good. If not, then you bring the patient back for a surgical procedure. Now, I think this approach is more practical because I think it, it's more realistic to be selective about who to do medicinal cryo for, um, for reasons of... You know, cost, resource allocation. Um, it is a safe procedure, but not because it's safe that you should be doing it for everyone. Okay, so here is the cryoprobe sticking out of the ebascope. Um, if uh, it hasn't made clear yet, when you do an ebus cryo, you pull the scope and the probe together and block. If you pull the probe through the working channel, you will lose the sample. So everything comes out completely together. And my question for, I guess, for those who do this under conscious sedation is, 
if you're doing this in and out many times, um, you know, I, I just uh, always uh, I'm concerned about damage to airways uh, as every time you go through the cords. And I guess in my center, we always uh, intubate our patients for EBUS. Not because we, I prefer it uh, necessarily, but because it's an anesthesia policy that for most procedures where we do heavy biopsies, <clears throat> they want secure airways. Now, once you take out the EBUS scope and cryoprobe, you, I, I do touch preps. So what I do is I touch the specimen on the slide and send it for uh, analysis, rapid analysis. And afterwards, I drop everything in. I start with saline just so I don't touch the formalin into the tool as I go back to bring the tool back into the patient. And at the end of the case, I transfer all the specimens to formalin. Okay. So one of the issues that... Uh, I wanted to talk about this, how to create a track. So the two randomized trials that uh, with the largest populations, they used an electrocautery knife for all their patients. And again, that's another cost issue. They used the Olympus KD310 needle knife, which uh, I don't have this. So I just Googled and looked for the picture online and here's what it looks like. Um, a lot of the other centers and a lot of the case reports just used a needle to create the hole through the wall to create the track. Now, this uh, techniques actually started with internal forceps biopsy. That's the first time where we had to think about how to create a hole in the airway wall so that we can pass a device. Back then, it was the forceps. And they even used, uh, in some cases, a 1.9 millimeter forceps, pretty big. Now we have the smaller uh, core DX biopsy forceps, like 1.1 or 1.2 millimeters that are available. But in terms of creating a track through the needle, you have different needle sizes. You can do multiple punctures to create a hole. In some cases, you advance the needle followed by the EBUS needle sheath through the wall to further dilate it. And some reports have described a technique. This is more for EBUS uh, internal forceps, where they put the needle through the wall and then they flex the scope and create circular motions so that uh, they can create a bigger hole. In my center, I don't have the Olympus, but what I do is this image here is a needle knife that is actually used for sphincterotomy for ERCP. So it's a longer needle catheter but I'm able to put it through the scope. And once you stick out the needle, it's five millimeters out, practically the same as a needle knife. And that's what I use to, uh, whenever I need to, a needle, needle knife for my procedures. But in the interest of transparency, I haven't had to use electrocautery to create a hole for my procedures. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to be successful just creating needle punctures and passing the probe through. But in the event that I really have difficulty, then this is what I would use. Okay, so going back to the summary of the data of the published literature. Um, oh, by the way, while, while I was reviewing, uh, preparing for this talk, there are two other papers that have been published um, in addition to these um, showing similar results. But again, most of our, 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 our highest quality data comes from the two randomized trials. And you have your case series and a lot of uh, case reports. The other thing that uh, there was also a systematic review that was published. It's not, I'm not going to discuss it here, but they included only five trials of all those that were published. So going towards the complications, we talked about good safety profile, but there is one here, this one by Schwick, which uh, is actually in German. So it was kind of hard to find. I actually had to use Google Translate to translate the article. But they mentioned hemomedistinum, respiratory failure, and shock. So again, this is a very rare one-off case, but I wanted to share it with you. So 
they had a medicinal mass in a patient who is 70 years old. And so they did EBUS followed by cryo. Everything went well. And when the patient was in the recovery, uh, he suddenly went into respiratory failure and hemodynamic collapse. They had to intubate the patient and the patient was in shock, needed pressors, needed uh, blood transfusions. And on imaging, they saw this massive hemomedistinum. And of course, they attributed that to their procedure. The patient was in the ICU for a few days and they didn't need to drain anything, at least from their report. And the patient was able to recover, get extubated, and you know survive the complication. So um, it was really a, a kind of a weird, if, if not uh, really unusual, complication of the procedure. I highlight this because even though the larger studies tell us that it's the same procedure, you know, it only takes one bad outcome to really color our impression of the procedure. And you can have procedures like the massive hemomedistinum and presumably a pneumothorax can become tension and you can have hemodynamic collapse and all that. So in terms of the safety of the procedure, you should always follow your standard precautions. Patients who shouldn't be getting bronx, shouldn't be getting bronx with EBUS, let alone with EBUS cryo. Um, always monitor your medications if they need to be uh, held on their anticoagulation, antiplatelet drugs. That's certainly something that needs to be monitored. We're not concerned about aspirin anymore. And I wouldn't be worried about if it's just aspirin, but uh, bleeding uh, disorders you know, and other drugs should give us pause. None of these are emergencies anyway. Okay, so in summary, it's a very non-standardized procedure. There's a lot of variation in airway techniques, a lot of variation in anesthesia method, track creation. We didn't even talk about freezing time. Some of the trials go by seven seconds and some shorter, some longer. In my experience, uh, I go by the size that I see. Those of us who've done cryo, uh, know that uh, the alarm for low gas pressure signals when uh, it's empty, but even before the alarm lights up, you will sometimes note that your specimens still small or getting smaller or rather not as big as they should be. So there's this point where your gas pressure is becoming low, but not to the point that the machine is alarming. So in those cases, once you catch that, I do longer visiting time before I have to change the CO2 cylinder. The number of passes, again, is different. The larger trials only used one pass per case. And they have confidence that that one pass uh, gives them the, the diagnostic uh, material that they need. Most use 1.1 cryoprobes. There are a few case reports that went up to the 1.7. And looking at just the pool data, so overall diagnostic yield, EBUS TBNA from the, the studies that I reviewed, 80%, EBUS cryo up to 92. So there's no difference in malignancy, 95 to 99%, but benign disease from 50 to 60 up to 95%. So what do we, how do I use this information? So if, if I think that the pretest probability is pretty high for lung cancer, then in my mind, I will just be doing EBUS. And I will do proper metastinal staging, I will sample lymph nodes and all that. But if the presentation is not high for straightforward cancer, large mass in a younger patient, or the distribution of lymph nodes is pretty unusual, more, more anterior mediastinum, nothing in the hilum, or there is really no risk factors for cancer, or if I'm in an endemic area and I'm thinking this could be infection, then I would still do EBUS. If I see a lot of lymphocytes, I do flow cytometry in my center, and we have some good experience making diagnosis with uh, flow cytometry, but I will do EBUS cryo if the 
pathologist tells me that lymphoma is in the differential. If my EBUS from the rose, the pathologist tells me that there's some uh, granuloma, then I just collect more samples for cultures. But anything below all that threshold, then, and I'm not sure what I'm getting, then I would pass the cryo probe through the mediastinum. So in summary, there's some uh, early data, but clearly we need more trials, more studies, and more centers, and more groups to do this. Now, what are potential areas of development? So going back to the internodal forceps biopsy, we know that the yield for that is actually also good for benign conditions like sarcoidosis and also is helpful for lymphoma. Isn't as helpful with lung cancer the same way we see it in cryo. So might there be a trial comparing forceps versus cryo? I think this might be useful because if you can see that there's some equivalence, then we don't have to spend too much spend too much uh, on new technology in all our cases. And then how about a cryo needle? So there's a paper by uh, Frankie that they're actually working on developing a cryo needle so that it's easier to go through the bronchial wall without uh, having to use a different device. And I thought, how about an electrocautery EBUS needle? You're doing EBUS anyway, and you're planning to do a cryo. So maybe you can activate electric artery to create a bigger hole. So these are some things that uh, hopefully someone is thinking about and will be making available for us sometime in the future. And with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, feel free to contact me with this uh, email address uh, if you have any questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur, for that um, excellent um review of all the published literature on mediastinal cryobiopsy. We have, uh, we can take one or two questions. Um, so um, if, if you look at the paper, uh, the two randomized control trials, um, if you see that last paper that was published, they let's talk on the time of the procedure because most of these procedures that they are published is only on the diagnostic uh, EBUS, not on a staging EBUS. So, if you see the cryo uh, plus the needle TBNA, the time was 22.3 minutes. And if you see uh, the needle, it was 17 minutes. That means if you split that, like the average time for a diagnostic EBUS when you use the cryo alone is somewhere around five minutes. So if you consider cost as a factor, like uh, because we started doing um, mediastinal cryobiopsies without the use of needle at all, like we don't use needle for, uh, um, for the procedure. So we take the cost of the needle out from the procedure and uh, the average time to uh, sample a big lymph node, like a 1.52 centimeter lymph node, especially in four or seven, like hardly it takes three to four minutes to complete the whole EBUS diagnostic procedure. So uh, what is your opinion on this? Like uh, for, for, for selected cases, do you think like, uh, even, even if when you talk on cost, uh, in India, if you see uh, the needle cost, um, is coming around somewhere around 312 euros. If you talk on the biopsy needles, like the FNB needles, not the usual needles. And the cost for a cryoprobe is somewhere around 360. Like there's like uh, to the hospital cost, if you see it's like hardly there is a charge of 60 euros between the two, between the cryo and the needle. Hmm. So uh, that may be very high uh, in US, but uh, what we are thinking is when you, it's like if this 50 euro difference is there and then you remove that part of rose because for every uh, needle, you have to do a rose procedure, which again comes with an additional cost. Uh, again, some pathologist has to come, but we, what we do in our center is we just take two samples and then put it in, uh, do an imprint, we read ourselves and then send it back to the pathologist for histopathology. So what is your opinion on straight cryobiopsy for all patients for diagnostic EBUS, mm, even for normal malignancies? So uh, I, before I answer that, how do you get the cryoprobe through the wall? How do you create the track? Um, we have, um, I mean, like we have the uh, reusable Olympus uh, needle. Okay, so you just you, you just uh, create the hole, but you don't do biopsy through the needle then? Yeah. Okay, so again, each sender will have to make its own decision on what works, right? Now, 
in is it also important that the procedure time is less so you can schedule more cases is, is that something that you also because i know you're pretty busy from what i hear you do a lot of cases too so huh um that is certainly something that uh, is i'll be honest with you i didn't reflect on that in terms of the cost because the needles again uh, it's an embarrassment that uh, i will say this but um my concerns are elsewhere more on safety than cost when I do my procedures, but when, uh, or ad adequacy, but certainly if you find in your experience that it's going straight to cryo is helping you, then so be it. But there's, ha there has to be data to support that. Right. And I hope you're going to come up with uh, more results. So if you're just doing cryo, then obviously your yields are going to be very high. And if it's there's only a sixty dollar difference, sixty euro difference between needle and the cryo probe, then yeah, then that might make me change my uh, impression on how it should be done. Yeah, like uh, if you if you if you are interested, I would like to show like how we do in our center, just like a two minutes video. So what we do in this is like. Uh, You just observe the, oh, I mean, the time here, like when, when, how much time it takes for a diagnostic EVS. Like you have a big node in the four hour. You just go with your uh, EVS, just make a small track. Recording in progress. And then you just pull the probe out and the second operator is ready with the cryo probe. So you don't move your scope or uh, make any changes. And then just quickly the probe goes in and then um, actually, this procedure, if you talk on two passes of the cryoprobe, hardly takes two minutes to three minutes to come. Okay, well, that, that's that's pretty impressive and very efficient. So, and you only sample, or do you, how many stations do you sample then uh, with this technique? So, these uh, there are some limitations. I don't say we do this for all. Uh, we, we are providing some data on this. We're trying to publish that. Uh, like uh, most of our series, like we have 4R, uh, 7, 11L, and 4L. This is the predominant stations because uh, we don't do for uh, other stations at the moment in our center. We're just trying to, because our experience in the, doing in other areas is less. So these are the primary uh, nodal stations what we biopsied with this technique. And then we find it very uh, simple. Like if you have a diagnostic uh, EBUS, and even I see my fellows learning curve on mediational cryobiopsy, I just train one fellow and they're, they're quite not that bad. Like uh, because the needle is always, I feel like it is a little more risky. Um, the length and all these things. No, no, I think I think that that's, uh, I, I, I would, I'm curious to learn more about that technique. But thanks for sharing. Yeah, and second uh, thing I would like to ask you, like uh, in the paper which they published, like hemomediastinum following the uh, thing, uh, I think they also did an EBUS TBNA procedure, not just the cryo alone, right? Yes, yes, yes but, that's right. But there is a published data already showing that even in uh, normal EBUS TBNA procedures, uh, there there are case reports which show that there can be a hemomediastinum after the procedure. Uh, so. We cannot clearly differentiate whether cryobiopsy uh, produced the hemomediastinum or is it the needle in that paper, I guess. Uh, that is one thing I was also reading interest. Okay. Uh, fair. fair. And uh, uh, last thing is like, uh, uh, do you come across any problems pushing the needle, uh, the cryoprobe inside? Do you get that kink? Uh, some cryoprobes get kink like when you have resistance. So how do you overcome that? And what are your uh, personal experience in pushing the cryoprobe? Because so, many... Yeah. Sometimes it goes in the submucosal space, right? Just under the mucosa. So I, I think the my, my approach there is really the angle has to be perpendicular to the wall, best effort. Because if you're going at a tan tangent or a, at an acute angle, it, it might slide in. And it, when that happens, I might stick the needle again to create a bigger track. And uh, so as I mentioned, I haven't had the chance to bring out the needle knife to do it, but one of these days, I'll probably have to do it. Deepak, uh, do you have any uh, yeah. comments? Yeah, um, so it is definitely. Uh, I have noticed. I have done a couple of cases now uh, on Ebus Cryo, 
uh, it definitely has a edge over the ebus tbna when we have a benign diagnosis i actually did uh, 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 a case on sarcoid where ebus tbna was classically negative and we could get um, uh, granuloma on uh, only the cryo so i definitely feel that there is a uh, Im improved diagnostic yield as far as uh, your benign diagnosis is concerned but there is another concern that i raise about uh, how much bleeding uh, ebus cryo can cause especially in uh, in our set of population we see a lot of silicosis uh, in silicotic nodules uh, nodes especially when we sample we are likely to encounter uh, a lot of bleeding uh, i really don't know what's the kind of uh, situation when we have a cryo done on a silicotic node but i think in the in the paper in the in the rct there are few cases on uh, silicosis also mentioned where the diagnostic mm. yeah they did they did uh, from my experience the silicotic uh, mediastinal nodes they do uh, kind of bleed more i have not personally done a silicosis case uh, uh, with cryo uh, but <clears throat> i did uh, uh, feel that you know there is you know there is negative uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, there is uh, I think there are some uh, problems with the signal. Uh, so with this, what uh, we will end the discussion here. Uh, thanks, uh, Arthur, for uh, this uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, we are looking forward for more sessions. Uh, and then in the next uh, coming months, we have discussion on the uh, INOS, uh, the real-time uh, radial EBUS procedure, and uh, also on the newer imaging techniques. So, so the next uh, AOB webinars will be on INOD and uh, new imaging modalities in flexible bronchoscopy and uh, those things. So uh, thank you all for your patience. Thank you, Arthur, once again, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure.